We're very pleased today to have three experts um, in the field of chemical um, or multiple chemical sensitivities um, talk with us today. Um, I'm going to first introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Nash, who is an um, environmental medicine and emergency room physician, um, but is also a survivor um, of multiple chemical sen sensitivity. And we've arranged, or she has arranged, for two other experts, Magda Havis and Bill Meggs, to talk to us as well. And so with no former, further ado, I'll turn it over to Lisa um, to get us started. Thank you. So my talk um, is on environmental medicine and clinical approaches to mold exposure or mycotoxicosis and electrosensitivity and obesity. Uh, some of the principles that I'm going to discuss apply to so many different diseases. It's not just these three, but I'm going to give some supportive data to these subjects. <clears throat> um, also, I'm going to discuss a successfully treated case of severe electrical and chemical sensitivity and discuss treatment methods, because I think that's what the public is ready for. So uh, I don't really have any financial you know, uh, conflicts of interest, but I do have involvement with various groups. Um, one of them is a nonprofit, the Preventive and Environmental Health Alliance, that for 10 years has assisted thousands of families to find medical assistance and uh, doctors nationwide, and facilitated talks. I've been giving talks at universities and government meetings over the past uh, 12 years. I'm vice chair of the Integrative Medicine Consortium, which represents thousands of doctors and other practitioners, and now we're focusing on the Flint water crisis and lead in uh, cities across the country that has become a popular topic of conversation and an urgent thing to really get a handle on. Um, I'm on the Health and Buildings Roundtable at NIH, which has um, been around for about three years. We have an annual meeting in December, and we would like to have more involvement of NIEHS as well, looking at electrical, mold, building materials, all sorts of exposures and considerations when we construct and, and, and build homes and workplaces. Um, I'm the medical director of the Environmental Health Center of Martha's Vineyard, and it's modeled after Dr. William Ray's practice at the Environmental Health Center of Dallas. And I invite any of you to go there and see patients with him. It's life-changing. It's the best center in the world. And uh, Dr. Ray is about 81, and he really knows uh, how to fix patients and has the best allergy testing uh, in the world. I was on the CDC's National Conversation on Chemicals and Public Health, where three recommendations that we worked on together um, were proposed and accepted by the leadership group. Uh, looking, one of them looked at mold toxins in pregnant women as potential contributors in the autism epidemic. And I presented to Congress on the uh, Subcommittee on Veterans Health, and we won support of Congresswoman Brownlee, who's the vice chairman woman, and Wes Ashford, who's a leading VA researcher on postural tachycardia. And he's told me that there is $100 million now being dedicated towards solely environmental exposure based on our work together. So my feeling is that healthcare billions would be saved by getting to the cause of disease, which is totally possible. And I'm living proof of that, which we'll go into detail in a minute. I'm honored to be here and to, to discuss the past and the future of environmental medicine, as well as the plight of patients suffering with EI or environmental illness, of which there are millions or tens of millions now. These doctors and patients cannot fly, take buses, stay in carpeted hotel rooms, coexist in lecture halls with scented attendees wearing cologne or shampoo in their hair that's not unscented. We can't go to the bathroom when there are air fresheners in the bathroom. This has made it hard to effectively communicate with agencies such as NIEHS or NIH. And we want to suggest studies that could be done on EI, um, but we may need to communicate remotely because some experts won't be able to come in person the way we are. Even when I lecture, I need to take detail, uh, to have detailed notes because I may have a little bit of persistent memory impairment from my suffering from the condition, so excuse my uh, looking at the slides. Um, but we can readily fix diseases by looking into the environmental roots of people's conditions. It's not theoretical, it's practical, often a very low-tech approach, which I will uh, describe. Um, I was taught in medical school to believe the patient by Plum and Posner, a very famous neurologist, 
who said when the patient had this hemibolism, she would walk through the doorway and have symptoms, and everybody thought she was crazy. And um, now I do believe patients, no matter how incredible their story is. This is an article that Cornell Medical School wrote about my work called Believe the Patient. And it mentions that after suffering from toxic mold, which made me sick, class of 86, I have devoted my career to validating and treating environmental illness, which I guess is what we're doing here today. So I'm going to discuss mycotoxicosis. And I feel, uh, from my experience and from seeing patients and Dr. Ray's patients, that mold is the most common cause of chemical sensitivity, electrical sensitivity, and chronic and neurologic uh, uh, immune disease. Sometimes Dr. Ray uh, feels that pesticides have been a bigger culprit, but I now think mold is superseding. Taking a history often reveals that the patient became sick after buying a home with a musty basement or going to a school or workplace with wet ceiling tiles or some other evidence of a leaky roof that needs to be repaired. Usually they're doing that at the last minute after the mold has already been there for a few years. Molds produced measurable mycotoxins in the urine. Aflatoxin, ochratoxin, trichocythines, and gliotoxin will be spelled out later, and we can measure them um, at a particular laboratory, and it's now covered by Medicare and Blue Cross. So there's no excuse not to screen the patient. Molds also produce VOCs, and I'm not sure if this is the right term, but I think it's 1,3-octadiene, has been shown in moldy homes in a Katrina home to be uh, uh, exposed, the fruit flies are exposed to this chemical, and they get Parkinsonism. And we have uh, many examples of people with Parkinson's-like symptoms from living in a moldy home, which resolves when you leave the moldy home. These are um, some of the mycotoxins that we've been measuring for the past maybe five or ten years at real-time labs. They would be happy to work with NIEHS in any capacity, I'm sure. And I've been checking maybe 100 or 200 patients for the mycotoxins, and the reds are the positives. People are sicker when they have all three, and now there's a fourth toxin called gliotoxin. I would say that aflatoxin is the rarest, and it's usually um, positive in autistic children. Aflatoxin's in peanuts, which probably everybody knows. Ochratoxin is a, a kidney toxin, and trichocythines are the most lethal. They've been studied by the Army because they burn off the skin. They're a couple hundred times more potent than mustard gas, and uh, soldiers, when exposed, have to discard the clothing. It's not washable out of the clothing. This is a ga uh, gas uh, chromatographic uh, assessment of the dust in a home, or uh, maybe it's not gas, um, of the dust in a home showing the number of mycotoxins present, um, because many more can be measured by chromatography than can be measured in the urine at this point. So mold harms the adrenal. There's great research in animals showing what we see in humans every day. Rats exposed to aerosolized, breathing in the trichocythines, are lethally injured. They die. Dr. Thurman in the Army in 1988 studied these rats and showed that it was only the female rats that developed adrenal necrosis and died. A second study was when he took testosterone and gave it to the female rats, and they lived. He made them into males, and they survived. So it demonstrates really what I see every day in my practice, that a couple in a moldy home will not become sick at the same rate. The man will become less physically impaired but have maybe uh, belligerence, uncooperative behavior, uh, memory loss, and sometimes cutaneous rashes. The woman will become chemically sensitive, fatigued, and completely impaired and disabled. So the woman becomes sick first, the husband does not believe her, and they often divorce while she's searching to find a cure for the illness. I would like NIEHS to design a study of this in humans who are mold exposed, as this is such a common phenomenon. This is an example of life-threatening pemphigus foliaceus due to mold exposure. It's now in the healing stage. The person completely uh, blistered the entire skin, back, front, everything. And um, with detoxification and getting out of the moldy home, the rash has cleared up and been well, been good for about 10 years. Another trigger to this particular autoimmune disease with positive desmoglein antibodies in the skin was gliadin or gluten. The person went off gluten and there has never been a lesion. The person eats gluten and gets a lesion the next morning. 
they say that the most common triggers to autoimmune disease are mold, mercury, and gluten. So with autoimmune disease, you take a history and do that for part of the workup more uh, at the beginning. So there was a family of four, and they had rising mycotoxins in the urine after leaving a moldy home and the clothing. So why do the mycotoxins continue to go up in the urine if they left the toxic environment? And why was the father's urine negative? The wife and kids did sauna, and the father did not. He was incredulous. This inspired me to do a pilot study on urine mycotoxins pre and post sauna. So I haven't published, but I did do some research. I sent people for urine testing before sauna and after, and I had them collect the urine one, after, one hour after a 30-minute sauna, about 150 degrees, low temperature. Invariably, every single case, the toxins went up on the second specimen, most often the ochratoxins and the trichocythines, and sometimes aflatoxin. The numbers went up five to 10 times after the sauna. So I tested about 30 patients, and I presented this at various meetings. Here's one patient. Pre-sauna, you see the ochratoxin value is zero, and so is aflatoxin, and trichocythine is very low. The afternoon case uh, specimen shows ochratoxin of 2.8, where a 2 is a positive. The aflatoxin was 6.8, where 1 is a positive. And the trichocythines are positive at 0.6 because that's much... Um, the parts per billion is 0.2 for a positive trichocythine. So a 0.6 is highly significant. So the significance of the sauna mycotoxin study is that it shows that it may be useful as a treatment to get the toxins out of the patient, as we see in other toxins that have been measured in both sweat and in urine after doing sauna for solvents and pesticides. Um, also, it gives a higher yield for the test. So if you get a test before sauna, don't give up repeat the test, and the repeat tests are 66% off. So really there's a financial incentive because of this one family and their mystery case, they've made testing available to all to make the diagnosis. So the mental and neurologic symptoms of mold exposure include becoming chemically and electrically sensitive, potentially. You can get adrenal insufficiency, dysautonomia, which we're going to go to, into in detail. You can get a change in the neurotransmitters and therefore behavior and mood, you can get a decline in the nutritional status because you're using your nutrients to detoxify and there's nothing left, especially glutathione. You can have tissue hypoxia, and that's damage to the capillaries leading to hypoxic tissues throughout the body. You can get direct toxic effects on the brain by spec scanning, uh, illustrated by spec scanning. And you can develop antibodies to the nervous system, skin, and other. And there's a great book called Mold and Mycotoxins by Kay Kilborn. Um, who is now deceased, and he published uh, a number of articles showing the changes that happen to people in wet buildings uh, in terms of uh, EEG changes, conduction velocity changes. It's fascinating. You can have an inhibition of protein synthesis, and that's been published many times, and you can have some changes in the membranes and cation transport affecting potentially L-type volt voltage-gated channel calcium channels, and this may be the mechanism of electrohypersensitivity, which has been discussed in the literature and at meetings by Martin Paul. And this is where the cutting edge research should be on these calcium channels and those chemicals or toxins that damage it. And then when you administer electromagnetic frequencies to somebody, it is doing something to those calcium channels, and then you experience uh, incredible symptoms. Chronic fatigue patients are la largely are mold exposed an infectious disease physician, Dr. Brewer, showed that 93% of chronic fatigue patients had mycotoxins in the urine. 55 controls were negative for mycotoxins, all three of those toxins that we just talked about. Chronic fatigue, chemical sensitivity, Gulf War syndrome, and fibromyalgia are in the same basket of diseases. So what I'm saying is there's no point really in separating them, they're environmental illness. Shanessa published that there's a 40% depression rate if you live in a moldy home. And as I mentioned, these other things have been published in the K. Kilborn book. Curtis and Lieberman and Ray also published a very good article on adverse health effects of indoor molds, which I would refer you to. So we're not going to go into detail about all the articles there are on the mechanisms of each mycotoxin on the body. But there is a, a world of literature, and veterinary medicine is much more interested in this than... Uh, 
physicians you know, that I have uh, talked to. There is an inhibition of mitochondrial protein synthesis, and this would have to do with energy production. And you do feel uh, very fatigued and weak when you get this syndrome. Spinal fluid analysis by Baraniuk at Georgetown showed that there are 10 abnormal proteins in patients with these syndromes, and they're never found in normals. So they linked all the syndromes together, and they made them separate from people without disease. Okay, so there's a pilot study I did on patients on Martha's Vineyard. I sent them for tilt table testing at Beth Israel in Boston or at Mass General, which is a Harvard hospital. About 80% of my patients that I think have POTS or postural tachycardia, in fact, have a positive test. So in the, in the office, you do the heart rate standing and the heart rate laying down, and it should be about 10 apart, and that's normal. 10 beats faster when you stand up. If it's 20 beats faster, it gives you a clue that they may have dysautonomia. And you can ask the symptoms. Do you fold your arms? Do you cross your legs? Do you pretzel your legs when you sit down? And this is to maintain venous constriction and keep the blood up in the head. So one would think these people are stuck with dysautonomia forever. In fact, the patients have been largely improving and are able to get off medications because we have treated them for their, their toxic situation. We've removed their exposure and put them in the sauna and carefully gotten their toxic load lower. Their neurologic system improves and the dysautonomia goes away. Environmentally induced POTS is not permanent, yet researchers are not really interested in environmentally induced dysautonomia. EHS, exposure to electricity, can make dysautonomia worse, and I'll give you a list of what makes it worse. So this is a definition of what chemical sensitivity is. It's a polysymptomatic condition caused by adverse reactions to air, food, water, and habitats. It can be modified by adaptation and your individual susceptibility in your genetics. It can be caused by mold exposure and chemicals to, in a large amount that then causes you to be intolerant to small amounts everywhere. It is not a psychiatric condition, but it can have manifestations which cause cognitive and behavioral symptoms. So people get, doctors get confused. Patient comes in, they're anxious, loquacious, annoying, have 45 symptoms, and they say, you just need the psychiatrist. What they need is, is help to get well, and having somebody to talk to about their struggle is not a bad idea. But they are not mentally ill. It is not, it is a physiologic problem. So EI is ubiquitous. We're all in a continuum from 1 to 10 of being affected by our environment. No one's a zero in this room or elsewhere. It's how you deal with your exposures that makes you more or less ill. So it's very common. And in order for you to incorporate this into your research, whether at NIH or NIEHS, you have to believe it. And you personally have to have a stake in it so that it's interesting to do your work and you're fascinated by your findings. Just doing it for work's sake isn't as fun as feeling like you're putting together the pieces of the puzzle that may affect you or your family member. So how common is chemical sensitivity? It's about 4% of the population. 15% of the population have some symptoms of being chemically sensitive, but the 4% are completely disabled. 40% of the population may have mild symptoms, and that's 75 million people. One-third become electrically sensitive. So how, as doctors, can we deny that these syndromes exist? It's ridiculous. Doctors are not taught about it in medical school. These are a number of studies that are done at public health departments around the country and other government agencies determining that it's 15% of the population has symptoms, and in the elderly and those exposed in the Gulf War who were deployed, it's double. So as you get older, your environmental exposures add up, and you become uh, potentially more symptomatic and potentially older women who are chemically sensitive can be a little wacky and they wear a ton of perfume. They are completely unaware that they are environmentally ill or they wouldn't put all that perfume on. A study of family practice patients in the waiting room of 400 people given the queasy, which is Claudia Miller's quick environmental exposure and sensitivity inventory, show that 20% of patients in the waiting room had symptoms of chemical sensitivity. Doctors don't really have enough time to get into it with patients, even if they were told this. The chemically intolerant group had a higher rate of depression, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, and alcohol abuse than expected. 
I see environmental medicine as the umbrella over all these other fields of medicine, including energy medicine and autism medicine. It, it really doesn't matter what you call it, but it's a comprehensive approach that deals with all aspects of why we get sick. Allopathic medicine is still essential to understand some of the physiology, but we've gone beyond that now. And the history of environmental medicine is that Wrinkle discovered the relationship between food allergy and eczema and headaches, and he published that in 1936. That's how far back this goes. In 1948, he published The Rotary Diversified Diet, and then when IgE was discovered, there was a division between traditional allergy and environmental medicine physicians that has not been repaired today. Provocation and neutralization allergy testing was discovered back in the 50s or so and is still used by environmental medicine physicians and ENTs and is very, it's amazingly curative. If you neutralize somebody to something they're sensitive to, whether it's a food, a chemical, histamine, their symptoms can be turned off very quickly. And anecdotally, I was using histamine when I came to travel. We were sneezing from the bedroom. It had, um, at the hotel, it had down feathers. And we removed the down, but the sneezing had persisted or the pollen here is high. So I used the histamine shot. And it's my dose that turns off histamine release or sensitivity to my own endogenous release of histamine, and I stopped sneezing. Dr. Randolph, who's the father of environmental medicine, followed Wrinkle's work and incorporates this into his understanding of adaptation from Hans Selye into the theory about addiction and tolerance to foods, alcohol, and chemicals. I highly recommend this book to all patients. It's called Alter Alternative Approach to Allergies, and it discusses even psychiatric manifestations of food sensitivity. And then Dr. Ray was treated by Dr. Randolph 35 years ago for pesticide exposure, and he, was a he is a cardiovascular surgeon who has then treated 35,000 of us, and I'm one of the patients that he treated. Here's the website, ehcd.com. He discusses the total environmental load and, let's see, uh, ideally avoidance of chemicals makes your total load go down. So the theory is, if you look at all the things in your life that are contributing, you can get better. This is the steady state and alarm reaction uh, diagram by Hans Selye, which I will not go into because Dr. Meggs discussed it. And this is a description of pollutant overload, where we have on one side endocrine and immune dysfunction, and on the other side, autonomic nervous system regulation, dysregulation. The blood vessels below are affected. You get endothelial swelling and damage. So most of these patients should be ruled out for adrenal insufficiency, autonomic nervous system damage, and mitochondrial problems. Uh, this is a young guy. I'm going to play a smidgen of his video. Lisa Naj, this is a patient who has come for treatment for the past week and wanted to give a testimony for our U.S. congressman and other people to hear about. Hi, my name is Jeremy. I uh, just want to let you know um, I came down here with uh, tremendous anxiety, uh, dependence on cigarettes. Um, I was very anxious. Um, I work in the natural gas industry. I own a business in the natural gas industry and um, became very ill over the last 10 years. Um, now, after having five days of treatment here, um, I've, most of my symptoms are completely gone. Um, I feel so much better. The nervousness, the anxiety, the depression, it's gone. It's lifted. Um, I find that um, the treatment here has really helped with uh, my positive outlook on life. And it's lifted the veil that I had o over my life. It's completely gone. Um, so I think that if whoever's out there listening to this, I think this would benefit to anybody who's had exposures to any type of chemicals in their life, um, any types of uh, molds, um, anything like that, would, they would benefit from this treatment. And um, natural gas, the way we found out that natural gas was a problem is because we skin tested and did an injection of it and I experienced all the symptoms I've been experiencing for the last 10 years. Uh, came out at once, and it was uh, it was very enlightening. I have one thought. Uh, we talked about having environmental exposure lead to problems with the autonomic nervous system and with the adrenal gland. 
And you've been treated for both of these problems with midadrine and also the hormone Cortef. And it may be hard to tell which thing is doing what, but do you feel that that treatment has been helpful for stabilizing uh, your heart rate and your blood pressure and making you think more clearly? Uh, definitely, that's helped uh, tremendously. Um, my heart rate is stabilized. So that's an example of a young guy who I was going to Congress that week and he was leaving in the driveway and said, here, let me give you a testimonial. It's not like we planned it. But when you see a person of the same age as a veteran describing doing this basic treatment for five days, and he may still have impairments for sure back in Canada, but the idea is he was able to get that much improvement just from managing the dysautonomia, the adrenal insufficiency, and doing the IV vitamins and allergy testing. And I'm sure I won't be able to go through, you know, all the slides that I'd wish to, but I'm just going to mention that POTS is this syndrome that really is significant from environmental exposure, and it's not well regarded in the literature as a cause. And let's see, these are the reddish legs when people have venous pooling. You can see that the skin color is more hyperemic. There are many things that make dysautonomia worse, and I would say that Dr. Christiani's work at Harvard on air pollution and heart rate variability signifies that NIEHS needs to do research on indoor air quality and changes in heart rate variability because it definitely makes dysautonomia worse acutely. You walk into a store and you need a wheelchair. You can't stand up from the dysautonomia. So I'm going to uh, sort of click ahead to maybe a couple of slides that are pertinent for what I would like NIEH to do. The summary of my case, we will now be skipping it because I was long-winded, but basically I was exposed to mold and mycotoxins in an aquarium shed that was built and attached to my house. The family before me was sick and very impaired. I became sick and impaired. Uh, electron microscopy said that I had hypoxic damage to the mitochondria and that I was told by the neurologist I was probably going to die from Lou Gehrig's. I have Addison's disease. I got the dysautonomia, and it's been 15 or so years, and I've recovered, and I can uh, say that I'm minimally chemically sensitive now. But I was wearing so much perfume and using commercial detergent, I could not tell that I was chemically sensitive. Dr. Ray treated me, and uh, I would say that recovery was um, amazing. My IQ had dropped 50 points and I was unable to ventilate at night. I was gasping, so I knew I was going to end up on a ventilator soon, and I was able to get to an Oasis bedroom in Dallas with hard floors, filtered air, glass-bottled water, and that alone was able to uh, turn me around within days, as well as IV vitamin C and oxygen therapy. In terms of other patients that I've seen there, diabetics put in an Oasis bedroom will drop their blood sugars within days. So I've shared a space with somebody, watched their blood sugars go from the 300s to about 100, and they can tolerate carbs without having the blood sugar go up again. Okay, so I'm going to try to skip ahead to the last slide and show you what things I would like to do in terms of research. So these are some of my desired actions at NIEHS. Let's see that I'd like to see happen. <laughs> I'd like to have somebody hire somebody like Bill Meggs, who's here, as a liaison or advisor to NIEHS or NIH in the area of uh, environmental medicine and bring researchers and clinicians here to present their work and interface with your researchers. Tell the AMA, please, that they have to revamp their archaic policy statement on chronic fatigue and Gulf War syndrome and that environmental medicine has no utility. It's 20 years old, and these physicians are holding the entire country back because of their personal beliefs. We need to study the effect of toxic air inside buildings on the autonomic nervous system, mold toxins on adrenal function, POTS leading to Addison's disease, drug and alcohol addiction, as well as essential hypertension. I didn't get to present very good information on the opiate crisis. But basically, teenagers are becoming more environmentally ill, whether it's Wi-Fi, mold, their toxic levels have increased. They're slouched, they're, they're tired, they're pulling leg, blood in the legs. They are seeking out vasoconstrictors of caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, and Adderall to treat their pots, where we would give midadrine. 
then the prolonged dysautonomia wipes out their adrenal glands after years. The adrenals get much worse. And I have data to support uh, the difference in cortisol output when you're standing versus lying. Then they crave heroin because it makes them feel normal again when they feel so miserable on death's door. So if we treated them for their potential adrenal insufficiency or dysautonomia and do a little sauna and supplements, this would be much more efficacious than plain old rehab, I believe. We need to study ALF from Dr. Ray and the mechanism of action of boosting the immune system. It's autogenous lymphocyte factor and it is unbelievably useful in people with, with T-cell dysfunction. It saved my life. And we need to study provocation and neutralization allergy testing, which G. Monroe in England has just shown works potentially through calcium channels, the way EMF is maybe disrupting the body. So if we can prove the allergy testing is efficacious, how it works, Medicare could pay for it, and young physicians would go into the field of environmental medicine. We should work with Martin Paul and other experts in elucidating the mechanism of EMF, of EMF intolerance so that treatments can be determined for this unbearable and now very common condition. So I think I'm going to stop there. I had a lot of description of some of the details. I have many journal articles. But in a brief presentation, I wanted to give you an overview of how environmental medicine approach is practically available now to treat patients, and we need to bring it to the public so that they can do to themselves what they need to do to get well and not necessarily even spend money on treatments, but to do things in their own home which can make them better. Anyway, thanks very much for having me speak.